to introduce Rick Wheatfield. Rick Wheatfield is the co-chair of the MIPI Security Working Group and serves as a senior director of technology at Qualcomm. He joined Qualcomm in 2007 and established the Advanced Connectivity Technology Office, responsible for the standards development organization that drives mobile interface standards. He has authored numerous publications and has been awarded numerous patents in mobile device architecture and operation. Rick's going to be talking today about the MIPI CSI2 security framework, a new approach for end-to-end -end protection of camera data streams. Rick, welcome to the webinar. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks, James. Uh, today we're going to spend um, about 25 minutes or so um, talking about um, CSI2-based uh, security for cameras. Um, of course, it's also applicable to any technology that uses CSI2, such as LIDARs and radars and, and so forth. MIPI has been developing um, a security framework um, for the last um, for the last couple of years, essentially to protect um, CSI2-based data streams. Um, the primary application what we're discussing here is is for ADAS and autonomous driving. It's also applicable. Uh, the framework is um, to securing uh, the connectivity to to various display types. Um, we refer to the to the framework. Uh, sometimes as source selective partial integrity and encryption, uh, essentially to try and capture, you know, very, very succinctly the key attributes um, of operating at the application layer. So the application layer reference has to do with the fact that, um, you know, we're selecting different parts of the video source uh, to be protected in different fashions. Um, we're offering flexible security levels. Um, uh, including very specifically a notion of partial integrity, and then of course optional encryption. Uh, specifications are planned to be uh, available for for a member review in the new year. So the agenda will go through just a high level uh, summary of what we're trying to accomplish uh, with MIPI security. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about uh, these topics. One is the security extent. Um, we're going to try and identify the distinction between what we refer to as end-to-end -end, uh, and application-based um, security. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how security and functional safety are kind of wrapped together uh, within the framework. Uh, the focus here, of course, is on security. We're going to talk about security flexibility. There is a lot of kind of knobs, if you like, that the security framework allows the um, you know the the implementer to build, um, and then we'll close close with a summary. So, in terms of in terms of the introduction, um, you know, big picture, we have a car um, or or some large system, large meaning you know uh, interconnections that are on the order of ten meters or so. Um, a typical system here may may include up to 30 cameras, each one of which operates over multiple meters, up to 10 meters um, distance from the controller from the ECU, um, and each of which can operate from a range of speeds anywhere from 1 to 10 gigabits per second as a reference. Multiple technologies, anything that uses CSI2 is covered within this framework. Um, in terms of the, you know, the the Kind of the peer security uh, controls, essentially the CIA acronym uh, in reverse: authentication, integrity, and confidentiality. Uh, authentication is essentially the building trust between different components. The analogy I sometimes use is one of a printer cartridge. Um, when you plug a printer cartridge into your printer, it's essentially authenticated. Um, it ensures that the, uh, the printer cartridge is is from a known supplier and will meet the you know the performance requirements um, there are two uh, modes of authentication in MIPI security one is uh, the one way where the ecu essentially authenticates the component um, in this case the sensor and a two-way or mutual authentication where the reverse happens where the where the sensor is able to authenticate the controller uh, both of these options are available Integrity is one of uh, protecting the data, ensuring the data in transit is not modified. So, in the ADAS example, you don't want you don't want your data from the sensor being modified on on way to the uh, to the controller that will process it. 
um, that is provided by a MAC or message authentication code. Finally, there's confidentiality, uh, which is in which is provided by message encryption. Um, and here, essentially, you're hiding the data. You're you're kind of obfuscating the contents of the data. Um, one of the questions that we often ask is, um, you know, which is more important? Uh, the short answer is integrity is generally viewed as um, as a kind of a higher priority, if you like. There are some examples where confidentiality um, is also needed, but in the framework, um, it's it's generally viewed as optional. Whereas the other two steps of uh, authentication followed by integrity are are required. Uh, the mass stack, if you if you've attended the earlier parts of this forum, uh, you probably have seen this slide before. Essentially, the security layer is where uh, this talk focuses. Um, and in the case of CSI2, it it, um, it relates to three specifications. Uh, the MIPI security framework, which is essentially kind of a base document. Uh, the CSE, which is the, um, the uh, service extensions applied to camera, um, camera service extension, and then the command and control interface service extensions, essentially I2C based uh, security. Um, and you can see here that uh, security is, you know, works hand in glove with functional safety. We'll talk a little bit about that in an upcoming slide or two. So the first topic is one of security extent. Extent, of course, means typically how wide things are from a kind of a functional perspective. Um, you know, there are two terms sometimes used interchangeably, but we're trying to explicitly identify the differences just to point out uh, some of their some of their aspects. So essentially, MIPI security, but this also applies to functional safety extent, may be described in two ways. So what do we mean by end to end? By end to end is essentially the you know identifying what is the ultimate data source, where is the data being originated, if you like. Um, you know, traversing all the way to the ultimate data sink is which is where the data is consumed. Um, and notice notice that this does not involve the data transmission goes through, but does is not modified in transit in the intermediate bridges or aggregators or any other components in the system. Um, in the MIPI one to five model, which is shown in the upcoming slides, this means extent one to five. In other words, not involving any of the intermediate entities. So that's end to end, essentially from data source to data sync. Application based is a little bit different. Um, this is contrast to some other modes of securing uh, data transmission, which is generally called link based. Um, but what we refer to this as um, in the source and the sync, essentially the data is sourced and, and sunk at the application layer. Um, in the context here, um, and there are some slides coming up that describe this more explicitly, by application layer generally in this domain is meant pixels, so camera pixels. Um, so essentially application based means um, from that data protection is applied where the data is generated, pixels are generated and where the pixels are consumed for processing. So this distinction end to end, if you like, is kind of a physical thing. It's from the, where data is sourced to sunk and application essentially moves up the stack from where the um, pixels are, are originally generated and then consumed. So this is a reference topology. We refer to this as the one to five model. Number one is the controller. All the way to the right is the target. Um, in this case, it's camera. It also applies to display. Um, we, do, we identify five functional components. Uh, the bridges, the controller bridge and the target bridge. These are essentially the entities that allow you know, the transmission to go 10, 15 meters. Um, in, in some sense, it's a, it's a, it's a range extender. Um, the forwarding element in number three is essentially something that allows duplication of data streams um, in, in some sense for multicasting. These components need not necessarily be discrete. Um, the topology options in the bottom illustrate that in some cases, the bridges are integrated into the endpoints. Um, into the sensor or into the controller. There can be discrete bridges on either side or both. Um, and essentially, the end-to-end -end protection um, is identified as the data transmission from uh, between one and five. Um, and security is typically um, implemented in one and five, typically the application-based um, uh, that MIPI supports. Um, 
and the intermediate components two, three, and four to not play any role in the data plane, um, in the in the uh, data plane security. Um, there is a secure connection between the controller and every component in the system at the very minimum for the um, you know to secure the control plane, um, but the data plane security is only between one and five typically. The security framework does allow security to be implemented in two and four, but typically um, typically it won't it won't be built that way. So this is the one to five model. Uh, and again, um, the one to five model and in effect everything that we're talking about here for security also applies to functional safety with of course, you know, different data protections. So the layering, so Again, kind of application layer. This is a stack. If you're a CSI2 person, uh, you're you're familiar with this stack up on the left hand side. You send is essentially the before picture, where there's no data protection. We see the application and the and the and the pixel uh, generation um, at the very top. That's the application layer, um, and then it enters ultimately the the you know the file layer. It's transmitted to the other side, and it goes back up the stack. Uh, to the application layer in the in the, um, the receiver. Um, again, in the, in the camera case, the the flow is from sync is from source to sync. Um, the you know the one to five model when applying security, um, whether it's over C phi D phi in the middle picture or over A phi, um, essentially the same application layer exists. Um, the service extensions for security and uh, functional safety are applied in the application layer. And there's a particular ordering that we'll talk about in that if you look at it, um, the security is actually applied first and then functional safety is wrapped um, around the security. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that specific ordering in a, in a, in a few slides, um, but in effect, the, um, you know, the security and functional safety extensions um, you know, are applied at the application layer. Uh, the other comment is that by by applying security at the application layer, that does allow the system to operate, um, you know, to implement different security measures for different parts of the application. If you if you recall, application by application is really meant pixels. So any in principle, any part of a CSI2 frame, the pixels can be protected in a different fashion than other parts of the frame. And that's of course something that we will talk about in a little bit. Okay, so now the service layering. So um, in a nutshell, we refer to this as on the TX side, security first and then FUSA last. So what does that mean? Um, this picture may have been showed earlier in this, in this forum, um, but let's talk a little bit about it here. So the flow is you have plain text on the left, ultimately being transmitted into plain text on the right. Um, a transmitter is on the left, the sync receiver is on the right. Uh, the blue box illustrates security. So as the source uh, is transmitting its data, it is first secured. Um, what that means is um, the ciphertext um, is the secure data. Uh, it could be integrity protected through the use of a Mac and it could also be encrypted, uh, which is that yellow shade. Um, there's also a message counter, a security message counter identified to, for a very specific reason of detecting so-called replay attacks. Um, once the security is done, then it enters a functional safety layer. In that case, the, there's also a message counter. Um, there's also primarily the CRC. So essentially what happens here is that the blue security is done first, subsequently followed by the green functional safety. Uh, in the receiver, the process is reversed. First, you enter the functional safety layer and then enter the security layer. Um, there's no particular ordering in which this, uh, even though this is kind of a functional stack, there's no ordering necessarily implied. Um, typically, um, you know, it's done in that order. Functional safety is processed first. Um, if the functional safety passes, you may then enter the security layer. But in effect, the way in which MIPI specifies it is that essentially those two processes, the receiver uh, implementing security and functional safety are done um, in some sense in parallel. 
um, and certain fail indicators are then passed up into the system. So failure management or what, what actions you take on different um, you know, aspects of security or functional safety uh, indicators is, is, is out of scope. So this layering is, is something that is um, you know, predominant um, for cameras and displays in the MIPI framework. Um, and, and again, applies to both security and functional safety. So flexibility. So we've spent quite some time um, in defining a, a, a very flexible uh, framework for security. Uh, in some sense, it's a lot of knobs. There are a lot of controls. Um, the, uh, the very basic uh, element of this, the starting point is, of course, the CSI2 frame. Uh, the CSI2 frame is largely composed of pixels. Um, the, the frame is kind of sliced and diced into five so-called frame partitions. Frame partition one is the frame start. Frame partition five is the frame end. Frame partition three is the, uh, the pixel data. And then there's uh, there's a top block and bottom block, essentially in some sense metadata or um, you know support data for the pixels. Um, so this is a CSI2 frame. There's a CSI2 frame per so-called virtual channel. Um, there can be multiple virtual channels happening um, concurrently, in some sense interleaved um, over the over the over the transmission path. Um, the, the security that MIPI provides is essentially um, finely tuned to this structure. Um, in fact, you can apply different security controls to different frame partitions. Um, and hence the, the uh, flexibility. So security, um, the security is generally constrained or, or uh, identified by securing the data plane. Um, and then the control plane, those are separate parallel paths, if you like. Um, there are two protocols to secure the data plane, SEP and FSED. SEP is service extension packet. This is a packet-based security method, um, essentially one header footer, um, in, in effect, one MAC uh, for every CSI2 packet, um, hence the name service extension to packet. FSED is a frame-based service extension data, which is in some sense easier. Um, there's a Mac computed less frequently, um, but is, but both of them are you know you know have their virtues. Um, in fact, in many in many cases, both would be implemented in a particular in a particular um, in a particular product. And then there's the command and control interface, um, which is also secured in in this in its simplest form. It's adding security to to an I2C channel or to an I2C um, um, pathway. Um, in future, it will be, of course, moved to I3C by virtue of its kind of 10x or, or better, um, you know, performance boost. So, you know, big picture, we have CSI2 being protected um, with uh, one or both of SEP or FSED protocols, uh, and then the, um, the I2C um, protected um, with the CCISE security mechanism. So this is a high level picture of the um, of the of the different of the different protocols SEP and FSED. If you on the top one, you can see the CSI2 packets uh, indicated in white. Um, FSED implies the definition of additional CSI2 packets that effectively identify the um, you know the the MAC um, for different parts of the frame. Um, and these are additional CSI2 packets in the case of SEP and the bottom, essentially take every white packet on the top and put header and footer around it. So you can see that these are mutually exclusive methods of protecting the, um, of protecting the, um, you know, the image data plane. Flexible security. So with, within the context of the CSI2 frame, where there is five frame partitions, FP1 to FP5, we have these four different controls. Um, we have a different, we have two different protocols, FSET and SEP. Uh, we identify uh, a set of um, uh, crypto algorithms, uh, a performance one, which is higher, uh, higher complexity, and then an efficiency one. Uh, we have what we're calling a tag mode. Um, if you're a security person, you recognize that a tag is typically the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, 
the, uh, the construct of identifying the Mac and message counter and other things that are supporting the, um, you know, the, the message that the security is provided. Uh, security variants are essentially uh, other controls that identify things such as the partial integrity that we'll talk about. Most of these are fixed over some extended period of time, several frames. Um, there's typically one protocol in a system and, and you operate either in SEP or FSED, but the other three controls uh, can be varied, uh, can be modified on a frame basis, although typically you would operate over multiple frames, um, potentially, you know, for minutes to hours um, in a particular in a particular mode. So this is kind of our, our flexibility framework. Um, in terms of the FSET and SEP, this is a slightly different. Uh, so this is our first kind of control. Um, you operate in either FSET mode or SEP mode. Uh, in SEP, you can see that on every CSI2 message, you insert a header and a footer. And this, you know, and this applies through every frame partition, FP1 through FP5. Um, where FSET is different is it effectively does not modify every CSI2 packet. In fact, it just inserts two or three additional packets that, that, you know, that contain the security information that, um, you know, that protects um, or that comprehends, um, you know, uh, the identified data in the frame. So, for example, the, the, the lighter blue uh, image data um, is protected in, in both cases, um, both the uh, FSET and the SEP, but it's done, but it's, it's protected in, in, in different ways. Um, a system may implement one or both of FSET and SEP, um, but there's a lot of, it turns out there's considerable um, overlap or considerable, um, you know, uh, similarity um, in those protocols. So it's, it's, it will, we imagine it will not be uncommon to, for a system to support both. Uh, the two crypto algorithm uh, types, efficiency and performance in a nutshell, there's GMAC for high, higher performance and CMAC for lower performance. Um, this distinction um, is essentially to identify different tiers or different categories of sensors, higher performance sensors that can support um, the GMAC hardware would support it. Uh, lower performance, uh, in some sense, potentially software implementations might support CMAC. Um, if you needed to kind of Put a, a number on the on the boundary between high and low performance. Think of it as you know a gigabit per second. Uh, a sensor that would operate at the low gigabit per second may operate in efficiency mode CMAC, um, whereas higher ones would operate in in GMAC. So tag modes again. The tag is essentially the end um, the end of a. a a transmission occurs at the end of a particular at the end of a particular message. So in this particular case, um, when you're supporting safety and security, you you would have a functional safety CRC and a security MAC. Um, you can see on the uh, in the graphic you have set modes. The tag modes are identified as one A, B, and then C, D, and F said it's a two A and two B. Um, Essentially, the it of course is the ECU, the controller that identifies the particular operating mode. Uh, typically, you set in a particular mode, let's say one A, which is a set mode, and you operate in mode one A. Um, and you would you would operate in that mode for quite some time. Um, this generally shows um, you know the flexibility in identifying different uh, different MAC modes. Um, how often MACs are are generated and, and then transmitted. Um, there are some other differences between the different modes uh, other than Cypher Suite, um, and then those, those, we may not get a chance to describe those here. If there are any questions, we can certainly address those. So these are the tag modes. Um, the security variants are identifying different levels of protection or relative security level. Um, again, these, these are, generally applied to different frame partitions. Uh, there's a mapping that identifies which, um, which frame partitions can be protected in different, in different ways. Um, those different ways include these security variants. So for example, SV1 um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the left of the graph identifies full security and full, full integrity, full and, and, and encryption on, 
whereas on the far right, um, SV5 was essentially no integrity and encryption off. And in particular, the, the different levels of integrity protection uh, through partial integrity are identified in SV3 and SV4, where there are these horizontal and vertical stripes of data that are included in the MAC. Um, the, the notion of partial integrity is new to, uh, to MIPI or is new in MIPI, um, and essentially it's identified to trade off um, the amount of security processing, um, you know, uh, and as a result, you're able to save, in, in many cases, you're able to save substantial power and or thermal um, effects. Um, as, it, as most people know, um, you know, thermal effects are, are a problem or maybe a problem in, in, um, in maintaining image quality. So it's important to, to have, um, you know, um, operating tools, if you like, to, you know, to mitigate that um, when needed. So these are the security variants. Another, uh, this illustrates um, which security variants are available in different frame partitions. So you can see that an F and and the the um, the squiggly box identifies um, where these controls are most are most evident in FP2, FP3, FP4. You can see that there's different different variants of the blue shades that illustrate um, you know what data is included in the MAC. Um, in 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 FP2, the top block, for example, you have four different um, options uh, of security variant. In the image data, you have you have five. You either have full full security in SV1 to no security in SV5, and then the intermediate ones have um, different levels of of partial integrity. Um, again, the ECU con configures these, um, you know, the the settings of SV as a function of each FP. Um, uh, typically, once in a while, meaning once every several minutes to several hours. Um, but in principle, these can be updated on a on a you know on a frame basis. Flexible security. So so of these of these four kind of flexibility options, typically you pick the protocol F set or SEP, and then you run with it for minutes to hours, and then the ECU would control the others based on kind of dynamic conditions. Um, typically, those can be changed um, infrequently, but in principle, as I said, could be, um, you know, could be changed on a, uh, on a frame basis. Um, the probably the most dramatic um, knob or tool in the toolkit is essentially the partial integrity, where the, um, you know, the ability to change the, um, you know the level of integrity protection um, as a function of you know power or heat or, or or some other consideration. So this is primarily the main knob for you know the flexible security. So so that kind of ends the main part of this presentation. We'll we'll, we'll of course have some time for for Q and A. So in effect, you know one of the goals of MIPI security is essentially to provide options for the different kind of tiers of sensors um, for the different manufacturers that have different, you know, different number of sensors, um, um, you know, different um, tiers of sensors, some, some high performance, some low performance. Um, but a couple of the main things that we've tried to do was, um, you know, provide the application level security where then you could have certain controls on different parts of the, of the frame you know, based on kind of system needs. Um, the, the flexibility enables system trade-offs, um, such as the use of partial integrity, um, you know, to, you know, to be able to, you know, impact the, um, you know, the heat dissipation or the, or the, um, you know, the power consumption in, in various components around the car. Um, the, the MIPI CSE, the, the camera service extensions can be used on any CERTES, um, where the CSI2 use is permitted by MIPI policy. Um, so essentially where CSI2 goes, um, so can this um, CSE security. And of course, um, you know, further information, please, please email um, MIPI or myself or Phil Hawks or uh, as the, uh, the chairs of the security work group. So with that, I think, I think we'll stop James um, and um, take, take some questions. Okay, great, Rick. Thank you very much. Super 
detailed as always. Security is interesting. Uh, just to remind everybody on the call, if you wish to ask a question, we're not taking oral questions right now, but we are watching and monitoring the Q&A chat. If you want to go to the Q&A chat, you click the three dots at the bottom right of your screen. It'll say panel options. Click on that and then click on the Q&A box and a little Q&A box will come up. So just as people are getting the Q&A box running, Rick, I've got some back channel questions that I've received by email. You know, this is a lot of work. Security uh, for CSI2 is a lot of complexity. The first question was, what caused or what was the impetus for adding this kind of level of security for cameras? Can you just talk about, you know, what what's caused this uh, work to be triggered within MIPI? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so this work was fundamentally initiated by the the work that MIPI started with um, automotive. So, so we're in automotive. Um, this started with A5 uh, security started shortly thereafter. Um, essentially, it was to you know secure things in preparation for ADAS. Um, so for the advanced driver assistance, ultimately for automated driving, whenever that happens. Um, it, it'll happen slowly over time, but in a nutshell, it was for ADAS, um, you know, um, authentication um, and, and then integrity and then optional encryption. So this was largely driven by automotive and ADAS. Okay, great. And again, I'm just checking the CSI, uh, sorry, the Q and A uh, panel to see if there's any other questions. Another question through the back channel: What is meant by the end-to-end -end security model? as opposed to at the FI or link-based security. Um, I think people want to understand how mass and how the end-to-end -end works and, and what's unique about it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Right, so so there was a slide that mentioned this, um, and, and I'm glad someone brought this up again, because we're, again, we, we, we've tried to distinguish end-to-end -end versus application-based. Um, but by end-to-end, -end, again, you know, you know, look back at the slides as well, but end to end essentially, essentially means from the data source to the data sink. So even if you have a number of intermediate components, um, you know, bridges, aggregators or whatever, um, end to end means where the data is, where the data begins, which is in the sensor to where the data is processed, which is in the controller. Um, the, the other part of it is the application based, which, which I hope has become clear, which is, um, you know, at the CSI2 layer. So we're able to kind of selectively control um, the security level, um, you know, in a very granular fashion within each CSI2 frame. Um, so, so yeah, end-to-end -end and application-based are, are two of the kind of key distinguishing features of, um, of, of this uh, MIPI security. Okay, great. And just checking, you no know, other Q&A, one last question, Rick, from the back channel. Uh, what was the easiest and what is the hardest part about writing the CSI2 security specification? So very broad question, but I think it goes to what's the easiest part of the spec, what's the hardest part? Mm -hmm. I, I think the hardest part was actually determining the, you know, the handshake, um, you know, what um how do you set up security um you know many of us and, and by the way you know the maybe security was developed with with a lot of you know a lot of sensor in fact all the the key sensor providers and the processing companies um, the hardest part of it was essentially to identify the handshake so in what we ended up doing was was leveraging the dmtf um, spdm handshake um in some sense those folks um, you know, borrowed a lot of the, um, you know, the components of the handshake from TLS, which is a well-known kind of big internet um, uh, method, um, but more, but kind of turned it into a more kind of localized, kind of more focused um, handshake for servers and and that sort of thing. So it took us quite some time to identify that as the as the handshake. So what we ended up doing, of course, is is using SPDM, which is in some sense, uh, you know, a more localized version of TLS. So that that in, unto itself was probably the most the most difficult one to, um, you know, to um, to get a handle of. 
um, you know, to get a handle um, on. Um, right now, I would say that, you know, in the first quarter, we're, you know, we're, we're kind of nearly done. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, we're kind of cleaning up registers and, and putting the final touches on the spec. But in hindsight, yeah, I think the toughest one was the handshake. Okay, great. And what's the easiest part of the spec? What's the easiest part of the spec? Um, yes. Well, I, I think Developing it was spec. No, yeah, yeah, right. I, I think it was knowing that CSI two is used almost everywhere, so that if we build something that's based on CSI two, we know that there's a solid footing, you know, in the industry. So we didn't have to change CSI two; we simply leveraged it. Um, so I think, in some sense, that's you know, that was the easy part. Okay, great. And seeing we've got nine minutes left. Uh, last question under the wire, Rick, can you just go back to that stride pattern slide? And then I can feed the question from that. It's the one that had the multiple stripes and the stride patterns in it. I think it was just a few back. Mm -hmm. The question, well, just while you're navigating to it, uh, the question is this, um, that you've mentioned partial integrity and this stride pattern, right? Can you explain mm -hmm. what this is? Why is there partial integrity in stride patterns? Right. So the stride pattern is simply a mechanism to quantify what data uh, is included in a particular MAC calculation. So, so in this case, um, where in, in the case of SV2, um, the security variant 2, essentially everything is blue. So all the, all the frame partition data from FP1 to FP5 is blue. What that means is it's typically, it, it means that all the data is protected. All the data is included in a particular, um, in a particular frame. In some sense, that's the normal paradigm. In order to save power or to reduce com active complexity, you want to only protect some of the data. The stride pattern is simply, you know, it refers to, you know, if you're taking steps, you're taking strides, you're, you're, you follow a regular pattern of on and off, if you like. So the stride pattern is simply one where you, you set up a, um, you know, you set up a particular paradigm of including this data and then stopping, including that data and then stopping. So in effect, you have these horizontal and vertical stripes within, within the, um, within the frame where, you know, data is in and then data is out, data is in, data is out. Um, and this is all parameterized in, in a particular way, but that's what is referred to as stride pattern. Cool. And Michael McDonald, last question came in on the wire here, under the wire uh, from Michael. Seems like the image sensor guys are all taking different approaches on security. Any thought about standardizing that at the image sensor source level? Or is the flexibility required, desired, because of the different application needs? For example, power, price, heat impact, or sensor images, et cetera. Any thoughts on that? Right. Well, well certainly, you know, today, um, in some sense, there is no standard. I mean, there, there, is no, there is no standard for camera security. So many of the, of the sensor providers, you know, they have to kind of roll their own. Um, there is no standard. Um, typically, many of the features that are now in the CSI2 security spec exist in the market today. Now they're just standardized. There's a standard handshake. Um, there's a particular way in which, um, you know, partial integrity is is uh, is applied. Um, there's a standard framework um, where. There's these FP one through five, SV one to five. There's a particular way to parameterize the settings, so everything's kind of buttoned down into a nice framework. Um, I would say that probably half of the features are new, but half of the features, in some sense, are, you know, exist, but they've been used in different ways by different parts of the industry. Um, so you know, you know, most of the industry uses CSI2, so that's a, a common ground. Now that we have a standard way to secure CSI2, um, that will, you know, um, implement kind of the, you know, the, the next wave of, of CSI2 security. Great, Rick. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. 
Okay, everyone, I'm going to wrap it up now. I'd like to thank personally uh, Ariel, Raj Kumar, and Rick for this great presentation. And of course, the MIPI executive team, Dervla, and all the marketing uh, team who've put and organized this webinar. With that, I'll conclude our webinar. If you have any further questions, go ahead and please email us directly. We'll be happy to answer them. I know there were a couple of Q&A questions that came in that we didn't address, uh, but those will be answered in uh, subsequent emails. Thanks very much, everybody, and we'll see you at the next MIPI session. If you're not a member, please join. Take care, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye, folks.